following is my conversation with David Simchi Levi. David is a professor of engineering systems and the director of the data science lab at MIT. He is one of the greatest thought leaders of our times in the field of supply chain and analytics. David's book on designing and managing supply chains is considered a Bible of the supply chain and has been a very relevant and very popular textbook for a few decades now. A new edition have just been published. You should definitely check it out. I highly, highly recommend it. Recently, David wrote about a simpler way to modernize your supply chain in Harvard Business Review. This conversation with David is all about what is a proper framework to think about modernizing the supply chain and doing the right kind of digital transformation using a practical agile approach that doesn't take too much time or too much money. This conversation is both a presentation and interaction between David and me. You would see here shortly that David is God gifted when it comes to explaining complex topics in a very easy to understand fashion. I learned a lot in this conversation from David. I hope you're gonna find it joyful and useful and hopefully it would give everybody a modern framework of how to think about supply chain digital transformation. And now here is my conversation with none other than Professor David Simchi Levi. David, sir, how are you? I'm doing well, uh, Amjad. Uh, I'm doing well. Happy uh, to participate in uh, uh, this event. Thank you for inviting me. No, oh, thank you for uh, being so generous with your so generous with your time. I, uh, David, have been uh, a long outstanding student and fan of your work. Uh, I haven't gotten the 2021 edition of your book yet, but I have the last one, which I think uh, goes to 2015 or 16, something something like that. So I'm planning on getting uh, the, new, uh, the new edition, uh, but I think the, uh, it goes without saying, sir, that you have educated uh, generations of uh, supply chain uh, students, practitioners. So, so it's awesome that we are going to today, you know, uh, have this opportunity uh, to talk about. And suddenly, spy chain is in the news a lot, David, as of late, for all the obvious reasons. So, tell us, uh, David, a little bit what is in your mind today. Uh, yeah. What kind of topics you want to you want to cover today? Um, again, thank you for the invitation. Uh, by the way, before I dive into the topic, today is an important day. You mentioned um, my book. Uh, today, I got a message from the publisher that the book is now um, available uh, also on Amazon website as a Kindle version. So thank you for uh, mentioning the fourth edition, just uh, publishing it. Include a lot of the material that we will, you and I will talk about. But today, my objective is to focus um, on uh, supply chain digitization and report my experience working with multiple companies uh, on their supply chain transformation and what are the challenges, what are the perceptions, and what we found to work very effective. Uh, all right, let's, sir, let's sir, get into it. Great. So as you can see here, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, deep transformation with smart supply chain digitization. But before I dive into the topics, 
it's appropriate to talk about the environment at MIT that uh, led Amjad to uh, this uh, type of work. At MIT, I lead uh, what is called the MIT Data Science Lab. The MIT Data Science Lab is a partnership between um, MIT and about 20, 25 different companies focusing on some of the most challenging problems that these companies uh, have by bringing together data models and analytics. Uh, our partners come from a variety of industries, oil and gas, retail, financial services, government insurance, airline, uh, and even uh, software companies. The Data Science Lab has a global footprint with partners in North America, as you can imagine, Europe, Asia, including the Middle East and uh, Latin America. Example of recent projects that we have focused on include uh, supply chain resiliency, uh, initially implemented at the Ford Motor Company, but after that, uh, a number of companies, including Schneider Electric, Sigma, which is um, a large food manufacturing company uh, in Europe and Latin America. And recently, you may know, Amjad, because um, you come uh, from um, MIT as well, that MIT signed uh, an agreement uh, with Accenture to scale up yeah. the supply chain resiliency technologies that my lab developed. A lot of work uh, on um, inventory transportation and procurement optimization for companies like Home Depot, like Mango, which is um, a large fashion retailer um, headquartered in Spain. Uh, work with software company like uh, Blue Yonder, focusing on uh, addressing some of the transportation challenges that their clients have. A work on supply chain digitization that I will focus on, of course, today. Um, work on price optimization, both for online retailers like uh, uh, Groupon or Rulala, which is a large uh, online retailer in the flash sale industry in North America, as well as work that we have done for brick and mortar retailer like Coppel, a large uh, Mexican uh, retailer. Uh, work on personalized uh, offering. Um, here, the, the work is very special in the sense that um, it applies to uh, multiple industries from airline to uh, insurance. Let me illustrate this with an example. If you fly today from London to Paris, when you purchase under your uh, airline ticket, we are not involved. But once you purchase the ticket, our system, think about what I'm saying, the MIT system kicks in and offer you ancillary product, uh, priority mm. boarding, car rental, hotel, and the offer uh, that Amjad, you will get uh, may be different than the offer that I will get because the system is learning yeah. about your personal taste, about your preference. It's either learning from your past purchases or it's learning from people similar to you. And this has made a big impact uh, in the airline and the insurance uh, uh, industry. And finally, work uh, on online resource allocation, ongoing work with um, uh, IBM and past work with uh, uh, a platform like uh, Alibaba. So uh, today, as I mentioned, we will focus on uh, supply chain uh, digitization. And when I talk about supply chain digitization, there is there a just one. There is just one sec. Going back to the data science lab for a sec. Mm -hmm. So it looks like data science lab is doing awesome, awesome work. In case, David, somebody in the audience, you know, some other big company want to partner up with uh, data science lab, what is, David, the protocol? They just go to the website and follow the guidelines there, or do you have some other uh, guidance for anybody who wants to get in touch with the Data Science Lab? Uh, great question. Thank you for that. Um, if they contact uh, me um, or the associate director of the Data uh, Science Lab, her name is Michelle Wu, uh, we will start the process of uh, having initial discussion to identify 
what type of challenges they are focusing on. And then collaborating with them, we decide what is the line of attack and how we make sure that not only we address their challenges, but also we transfer knowledge so that once we are gone, they are able to continue address the challenges they face. Very helpful, very helpful. Thank you. Perfect. So um, let me uh, focus now on supply chain digitization. It's a topic that needs very little introduction. There is a lot of excitement in industry about uh, using digitization to transform the supply chain. But what we have found throughout multiple implementation that there is a big difference between perception and reality. Perception in industry is that supply chain digitization requires huge investment, will take a long time. People typically talk four to five years. It requires instrumentation of every facility and product, automate, automation of every process, tracking across all uh, supply chain uh, parties. Reality, at least based on the experience that we have had implementing digitization to transform supply chain in CPG, consumer packaged good industry, in high tech, um, in uh, uh, fashion retailing, uh, uh, reality is different. What we found is that with moderate financial investment, by combining available data, uh, analytics, and some automation, by modifying existing processes and by designing new processes, companies can achieve almost all the benefit that full supply chain digitization can achieve. And this can be done in a relatively short amount of time. We are talking about a transformation that take typically 18 months, but it gives you 80 to 90% of the benefit of full scale uh, supply chain digitization. And so my objective uh, today is to describe a successful supply chain digitization uh, journey. Okay, and uh, as I describe the uh, digitization journey, I will highlight four key capabilities that cuts across all the implementations that we have uh, completed. What are these four key capabilities? Um, the first is all about moving away from consensus forecast and replacing mm -hmm. it with a single unified view of demand that cuts, that cuts across all the different functional areas. The second is supply chain segmentation replacing one size fits all strategy with a segmentation of product, channels, customers into clusters, each of which has its own supply chain strategies, and then identifying synergies across the different segment or the different uh, cluster. The third um, capability is around smart SNOP. SNOP is a process that has been used for many, many years. I am going to show how we modify uh, the process and automate some of the decision-making activities. Yeah. And finally, if SNOP is all about the plan, smart execution is recognizing that always there are deviation from the plan, supply disruption, demand disruption, and the objective is to make sure that we are able to respond very effectively to this type of deviation and disruption. All these four capabilities are based on three important uh, technology uh, components. Digitization, we'll talk about what data we are using. Advanced analytics, and we will explain what exactly we mean by advanced analytics and the ability to use data and analytics to automate processes. In some cases, these four capabilities require a change in the organizational structure. And you will see us talking about not only the technical component of the supply chain uh, transformation, but also on the organizational 
uh, structure that we have seen to work very well in uh, the transformation. Very okay. Good. Uh, what I'm going to do is to uh, cover the four different capabilities that I mentioned. I'll start by talking about a unified view of demand, then talk about supply chain segmentation, focus on smart planning, smart SNOP and smart execution, and uh, uh, summarize the event by talking about requirement for uh, success, again, based on the implementation that we have uh, done. What you see on the right-hand side uh, is the book that Amjad uh, mentioned earlier, that I just uh, mentioned is now available um, on uh, Amazon as a Kindle uh, version. This book has a lot of the concepts that I'm going to be discussing um, in this uh, session. But more importantly, uh, this presentation is based um, on a recent Harvard Business Review article that I just uh, published last uh, month, whose title is A Simple Way to Modernize Your um, uh, Supply Chain. Um, importantly, I will describe the four different capabilities that I mentioned, unified view of demand, supply chain segmentation, smart SNOP, and smart execution by discussing implementation at a large consumer package goods manufacturing company. It's a $15 billion uh, a company serving many retailers, uh, they have uh, um, dozens of brands with around 5,000 SKUs that are produced and stores in about 100 plants and distribution centers. The supply chain is a very traditional supply chain. One size fits all supply chain strategy. They use one strategy that basically emphasize efficiency everywhere in their business. The forecasting process is all based on consensus forecast. Each functional area will generate its own forecast and then they come together trying to agree on a compromise. Um, most of their processes are a manual, a huge amount of uh, data all stored in spreadsheet. And finally, despite their focus on efficiency, lots of inventory and significant uh, and significant uh, waste this is the company that i will use in my discussion illustrating the four different capabilities and it is uh, david i must say very representative of uh, uh, the types of companies who are the audience of this podcast and when we would later get to some q a you will see that their questions are kind of in alignment with uh, the type of case study that you're talking about. So very, uh, uh, very timely and very well aligned example, sir. Very good. And, and remember that as we talk about this company uh, and the implementation of the company, remember perception versus reality. The reception yes. was five years, big transformation. But what we saw during the pandemic is that you don't need that time horizon to get the benefit of supply chain digitization. That 18 months transformation, if you focus on key capabilities, you can get many of the benefits of a full-scale uh, supply chain digitization. And so let me start with a discussion of um, unified view of demand. And maybe the best way to understand what we mean by unified view of demand is to talk about the traditional approach. Yeah. The traditional approach, which is a consensus forecast, is to let each functional area design or come up with its own forecast, finance, supply chain, maybe uh, trade and marketing, and then they will come together uh, in a consensus meeting to agree on a compromise. It's not clear that the compromise correctly represents market, uh, market demand. Typically, they will use traditional 
statistical technique, and uh, I'm Jad, I'm sure you have seen this many, yeah. many times over and over again with some of the clients that you uh, collaborate with. Uh, using time series analysis, using moving uh, average or exponential smoothing to generate uh, a forecast. And finally, an important component in the traditional approach is to use intuition to identify what drives sales and revenue and profit for a specific product or specific family of product in a given in a given region. What we are going to uh, to do, is to replace a traditional approach with a unified view of demand, where we will use four different sources of data. Some are internal, other are external. I'll explain what are the sources of data. We will apply uh, machine learning techniques to generate insight from the data and to drive action. Part of the insight will be to let the machine decompose the forecast and try to explain to us what drive revenue for a specific product mm -hmm. in a specific region. Is this because of the product characteristic? Is it because of our pricing strategy? Is it because of our competitor behavior that drive revenue in our uh, case? So we are using the machine to complement the insight that people have not to replace their uh, insight. If you think about what I described here, you should think about these supply chains uh, transformation as demand-driven supply chain strategy or customer-centric supply chain strategy. These concepts are not new. They have been around for a long, long time. But until recently, they were no more than boxes on a PowerPoint. Great ideas, but we did not have the technology, we did not have the data that allow us to leverage this concept. Today, this is reality for many, many companies. So uh, let me start with the data. Remember I mentioned four different sources of data. I will present the unified view of demand from the point of view of a CPG company, of course, different industries, different uh, detail level, but I think this uh, give you a, a really a deep insight into the type of data that we are using yep. to generate a forecast. The By first, way, David, uh, yes. your, uh, uh, I was just reflecting upon what you just said, your classic approach that you just presented uh, a few minutes ago, many, of the current you know, companies and practitioners are using that classic technique. So it's a very common uh, pattern out there. So I'm so excited that uh, so many people are going to learn from this new way of thinking about it. Yeah, and, and your uh, observation is very consistent with my observation. If you pull randomly a company among your consulting uh, activities, among my consulting activities, they typically use a traditional approach to uh, generate a forecast. Yeah. This is a little bit different. So let's think about what are the data sources that are available and we can use. The first one is internal data that the, that the CPG company has. Internal data include the information about product characteristics. Internal data also includes shipment from the CPG to the retailer, as well as uh, uh, orders from the retailer to the CPG. Yeah. Included here also is pricing, promotion, and discount. The second uh, uh, type of data is external data. It's consumer data. Some retailer, but very few, provide the CPG with point of sale data, right? this actual sell that they can provide uh, every night. But these are very few uh, retailers. What we found to be more common is to use syndicated data provided by companies like IRI and Nielsen that allows you to better understand market demand for each product 
in each uh, region. The third level is microeconomic data like quarterly GDP, like unemployment, like inflation rate and so forth and so on. With the current changes that we see all around us since the beginning of the pandemic, this information is very critical for a success of uh, a supply chain transform uh, transformation. And finally, information that we got from uh, social media uh, sources. Google Trends, uh, number of mention of a specific product, uh, temperature, competitor prices, uh, pandemic information. Let me say something about competitor uh, price. Most companies can uh, uh, identify what is today's competitor price when they design their strategy. The problem is when we generate a forecast, we will generate a forecast in the case of this CPG uh, company for the next 80 weeks. Yeah. The competition is not telling us their pricing strategy 10 weeks from now, 20 weeks from now, or 30 weeks from now. So we need to develop, and Amjad, you know this very well, an engine within the engine that will predict how the competition will behave yeah. 10, 20, 30 weeks from now. And this will feed into our forecasting tool. Absolutely. So these are the four uh, sources of data that we have used, but it's one thing to identify the data, it's another thing to uh, make sure that there is a process that allow us to generate a single unified view of demand that can be applied by the different function within the organization, from supply planners to financial planner to sales, all the way to trade uh, price and promotion uh, planning processes. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to use a circular process. So yeah. imagine that uh, this process that you see at the bottom is a circular process, starting in step one by uh, getting information about the trade plan. Remember what the trade plan is? Yeah. This is the pricing promotion and discounting that the company has identified. We use this together with consum historical consumption information to generate a demand forecast. This is the forecast the CPG uh, generates of what the retailer will face yeah. skew by skew, region by region for the next 80 weeks. Does this make sense? So, yeah. so this is, and for this CPG company, this was the first time that they started generating a forecast, not of what the retailer will order, but what the retailer will face in the market, skew by skew, for the next uh, 80 weeks. We use this demand forecast, right, of what the retailer will face, together with past orders from the retailer to the manufacturer, to generate a forecast of what the retailer will order from the CPG for the next 80 weeks, week by week, skew by skew. Now, of course, when the retailer places an order to the uh, manufacturer, to the CPG, they don't know the business constraints that yeah. the CPG uh, company has. They don't know limited capacity. They don't know lead time. They don't know limited available inventory of raw material. And so we take the forecast of what the CPG believes the retailer will order, and we uh, use a supply planning tool to design, to decide what is the supply plan, skew by skew, uh, week by week, across the different retailers. This supply plan, which is done at the weekly level and at a SKU level, is now aggregated. All weeks within a month are aggregated to a, a monthly forecast. All SKU within one business unit are aggregated uh, into the entire volume in this business unit to generate a financial plan. The company has its financial target 
And so yeah. we compare the financial plan to the target. And we try to identify gaps, whether we are behind or ahead. And depending on whether we are behind or ahead, we may need to change our trade plan. We may need to have a deeper discount or may decide there is no need to a deeper. In fact, we can reduce our discount because we are driving too much demand and we don't have even the inventory to support that level of demand. That's why I call this process a circular process. Yeah. And as you apply this circular process, there are important questions that we hear from executives. The first is, what can you tell me about forecast accuracy? So let's see, there are three levels of forecast that I am uh, describing here. First, the initial forecast of what the retailer will face in the market week by week, skew by skew. Remember, and I will use one important supply chain concept, which is the bullwhip effect. The bullwhip effect suggests that variability in market demand is relatively low. In fact, this is supported by the result on the forecast accuracy. Forecast accuracy at the consumption level, the forecast generated of what the retailer will face is highly accurate. Skew by skew, week by week, we are talking about forecast accuracy of about 80%. I need to tell you how I measure this forecast accuracy. So this measure is one month out. So I generate a forecast today and I measure the forecast accuracy in week five, six, seven, and eight. Okay. This is what is called one month out, 80% forecast, uh, forecast uh, accuracy. Now, you may ask, what about the forecast accuracy of retailer order to the, to the CPG? I can tell you by how much we improve the forecast uh, accuracy of retailer order. Remember, the, the CPG never generated a forecast of market demand, so there is no baseline to compare to. Yeah. But the CPG always generated a focus of what the retailer will order from them. So now we can compare what comes out of this process relative to what they did through the consensus forecast. And we found depending on the specific an improvement, again, one month out, an improvement by 15% um, skew by skew, week by week, when you measure it one month out. 15% improvement in focus accuracy is a dramatic a dramatic now financial plan remember the financial Maybe just plan uh, one one yeah. thing on retailer order forecast i would share with you from my observation that algo working with its customers a lot of companies our customers do struggle with the retailer order forecast uh, they find it very difficult to figure out what the future walmart Target, Amazon, Home Depot, Amazon, you know, whatever those orders are going to be. And variability in that specific forecast is relatively high. So it sometimes, you know, people feel like that retailer systems are difficult to predict. Uh, do you have, while your circular model uh, places emphasis on that, hey, if you start with your trade plan and you have a good consumer demand forecast, your ability to do a retailer order forecast is going to improve upon. But do you have any other insights or suggestions? Because this retailer order forecast is an area, David, that everyone that I know today, they struggle with. Yeah, this is a very important observation. And, and the reason everybody is struggling with that is because retailer orders are highly volatile. But market demand is not that volatile. It's volatile, but not at the same level. And so if you use that information on market demand, which drives the retailer order, right? How retailers make their order based on market demand, based on uh, their inventory, based on their business constraint, it allows you to improve. We will never be perfect. The only question is, can we do better 
than what uh, the, the CPG is doing today. One question and, and, here for you on, on this mm -hmm. one. Some of our current, you know, uh, customers and stuff, they, wherever retailers uh, are willing, uh, these CPG companies or manufacturers are collaborating with retailers saying, look, this is my demand forecast. Would do you want to share with me yours? I predict that your system is going to send me the following orders. Can you share with me how you have set up your system so that I can predict it better? Because you want me to, when I receive an order, to do the on-time in full uh, OTF metric fulfillment. So uh, uh, what is your advice for retailers, manufacturers to collaborate and compare notes and share information so that uh, there is less of a guesswork and you can make more systematic and accurate decision. Do you have, David, advice for industry on, on that topic? You, even you mentioned that sometimes different companies come from the perspective of, I am going to hold my notes to myself, uh, I'm going to send you an order. Don't ask me why I sent that order. Your job as a manufacturer is to just fulfill it. Don't ask me any questions. But from a new modern approach perspective, I feel, David, that there is no, within the right rules and constraints, there is no downside to collaboration and comparing notes and that kind of a thing. But what do you, what's your thought or advice on that topic? Collaborative forecasting, planning uh, strategies have been around for a long time. And what you are describing is right on target. To uh, allow um, companies to improve their business, collaboration is a critical part. The only question is, how do you achieve it effectively, right? Yeah. And, and, and part of the challenge, part of the challenge is not a technical challenge. Part of the challenge is a trust uh, issue. Yeah. Let, me, let me highlight this. If you look at my book, it's not about my book, but you trigger um, uh, a discussion of uh, a chapter in the book about supply chain collaboration. Um, I have in the chapter on supply chain collaboration about 10 case studies where uh, supply chain collaboration uh, uh, were implemented. In most of the cases, they have been very successful. But there are a couple of examples, three examples in particular, where it failed. And it failed not because the technology and the capability was not there. It failed because one party did not trust the other. So building trust between the partner is probably the most important challenge that you face when you think about collaboration that takes time, that takes effort beyond thinking about uh, technology and uh, data. And I describe in the book how some companies were able to build long-term trust in relationship to allow them to avoid the type of problems that I just mentioned. Spot on. So, so uh, before I, I uh, continue the discussion with other topics, let me just finish the discussion about forecast accuracy. Remember the financial plan is done at the aggregated level. Aggregated across four weeks within a month, aggregated across all SKUs within one uh, business unit. As a result, the accuracy of the financial forecast is very, very high. We are talking about 95, 96, 97% forecast accuracy, which is unbelievable. And that what allows you to compare financial uh, forecast with financial targets and change your plan, the trade plan, depending on whether you are ahead or behind in your uh, financial uh, strategy. This also brings us to discuss how to ensure adaptation by all the different uh, functional areas. What we found to work very well is to establish a forecasting center of excellence. 
that brings together people from different functional areas. Their objective is not to generate their own forecast. Their objective is to agree on the data. And once all of us agree on the data, we let the analytics generate the forecast. If there are doubts, when we look at the forecast, the question for the data scientist, for the demand planner, for the financial planner, all involved in the uh, center of excellence is to understand why there are gaps between their insight, their intuition, and what the technology is suggesting. Maybe uh, they are missing data. Maybe they incorporated the wrong number of open stores by the retailer. And I've seen this many times. The, the salespeople, we look at the forest, say, this cannot be true. We are not going to sell that many units in the Midwest. When you start to poke, why do you think we are not going to sell that many units in the Midwest during the months of November? They tell you, we know why. Because the number of stores that will be open during the November period is, is relatively smaller than on typical month. Aha, but this data is not included in our forecast. That's the kind of discussion that starts emerging in the center of excellence. And as a result, it brings people to agree on the data and therefore embrace the forecast generated in the process. How do you, uh, David, what is your suggestion for people to organize their data at the right level of granularity, fidelity, that kind of a thing, and also uh, any advice on selecting the right kind of attributes that have a predictive power. Uh, when it comes to attributes, uh, I have seen the falling political tension that I want to share with you. Data scientists would share their point of view about statistical correlation between different attributes and their predictive power for different segments of the market or at different hierarchy levels or different uh, time periods. Business people uh, in these centers of excellence approaches use their intuition about attributes that are important versus not important. And those discussions sometimes, you know, with all good intentions become a bit heated. Uh, and, and usually in organizations, you know, there is an organizational hierarchy and whatnot, you know, uh, uh, that whole syndrome of the uh, highest paid person's opinion often carries more weight. Uh, what is your recommendation on the attribute selection process and the whole data aggregation, data unification front? Yeah, yeah. So th this is really a very important uh, topic, which is part of such transformation. And in fact, in all the projects that I've been involved in, we had um, two work streams at a high level. One is data strategy, trying to address exactly the type of question that you are asking. How do, uh, what data to include? How we would bring this together and so forth and so on. But in parallel, we had the supply chain uh, work stream. Specifically about what features are important and what are not, our uh, approach has always been start from the largest one that is available for you and then uh, use detailed analysis to identify what features are important and what features are not important. And here is an intuitive way of uh, thinking about this. If I generate a forecast with all the feature and then I remove one feature and I realize, you know, without this feature, the forecast accuracy did not change or maybe it improved. I don't want this uh, feature to be included. That is part of a process that we are using. Now, that is not replacing the intuition that the supply chain people, the business people have, because their intuition can help us very quickly identify important features to include. 
what we want is beyond their intuition to identify hidden opportunities in the business. That's where the data science and the, the, the business practice bring work together to make uh, an impact. Put it differently, I come from the science side, but a project of this type is not just a data science project. This is a science and an art. The science yeah. is what I'm describing. The art is the business insight, the intuition, the experience that business people uh, have. By combining the two, we can make a bigger impact than each one of them. Agreed. Okay. So given uh, this circular process, we can now uh, switch to uh, supply chain segmentation. I, I, uh, this is a very interesting concept uh, because I started talking about supply chain segmentation in um, the third edition of the book that appeared in 2007. But at that time, nobody was following on the need for supply chain segmentation. Today, lots and lots of companies recognize that one size fits all strategy is not appropriate because you have many products with different characteristics. Uh, different retailers have different requirements. To give an example, uh, Walmart a few months ago introduced uh, a new requirement for in time and um, on time and in full that, that CPG companies need to satisfy. And their requirement is different than other retailers. So the strategy that you use to serve Walmart may not be appropriate for other retailers, say uh, Target. And finally, uh, companies have multiple conflicting objectives. So how do you address all these challenges? Supply chain segmentation really is at the heart of supply chain strategies. We start with detailed information about the retailer. You can see multiple retailers as well as about product. And I'm showing here five different product characteristics. By product, meaning by skew, by retailer, we have many features. And I'm just, this brings uh, your uh, earlier comment many features that sometimes the business people are not even including, but a lot of it are based on the experience and the intuition that uh, the supply chain people have. For example, by SKU, by retailer, information about sales velocity and sales variability, cost, price, and margin, lead time, seasonality, weight, and volume, and so forth and so on. We use this together with data analytics to identify what should be the supply chain strategy and how many segments we should use. And finally, how to build synergies across segments. Now, what I described so far is very high level. Details matter. So let's look at what we have done in the implementation for this specific CPG company, Consumer Package Good Manufacturing Company. And we as start, we go along yes. on this journey, uh, David, one of the things that uh, it would be good for you, sir, to comment upon is uh, sometimes company, David, mistakenly, as opposed to using all these uh, structural or functional attributes uh, to do clustering or segmentation, they uh, use the term segmentation loosely and they think they're hierarchies, you know, is segmentation. My North American region, my European region, uh, my whichever way they are internally organized, they think that is segmentation. Can you, sir, please comment upon that while that may be important in certain cases, segmentation uh, is not, you know, the internal hierarchy, organizational hierarchy, of a company? It's really, uh, Amjad, a great comment. Uh, segmentation is used very loosely by many business professionals to represent many different things. Let's give a few examples. If you talk to marketing, they do segmentation. 
if you talk to sell, they do segmentation. If you talk to a supply chain, they may have a hierarchy and they think about it segmentation. Segmentation here, as you will see in the next slide, is extremely specific. It is data driven and it support your specific supply chain strategy. So let's yeah. talk about what segmentation is in the case of the CPG. Remember, I'm starting, in fact, in the case of the CPG with about yeah. 40 different um, variable uh, features that I'm describing some of them in this uh, slide. We let the data and the analytics go through the uh, different features and identify what are the three or four or five key drivers that affects their supply chain strategy. In the case of this uh, CPG company, we identify three important drivers, volatility, volume, and margin. The question is why these three, right? If, and, and this is a question that I always will ask, right? If the analytics and the data generate something that we cannot explain, nobody is going to use. And so wh why is this we drive the supply chain strategy? Because they are directly related to the risk faced by the CPG company. Let's give an example. The higher the volatility, the lower the risk associated with a specific skew because it's very difficult to forecast demand, right? That makes sense. Margin, the higher the margin, the higher the risk. If I make a mistake and I lose a unit of demand, bigger impact on bottom line. That's also very clear. Volume is inversely proportional to risk. The higher the volume, the lower the risk. Why? Because if I make a mistake and I miss one unit of demand, as a proportion of total volume, the impact is much lower. And so in the case of the CPG, we focused on three drivers that I uh, described uh, in uh, the top of the slide. Now, I want to use the three drivers to define my supply chain strategy. And for this purpose, I am going to start by looking at two uh, drivers, volatility and volume. On the X coordinate, I'm presenting volatility from low volatility meaning low risk, to high volatility, high risk. And on the Y coordinate, I'm presenting volume from low volume, low volume imply higher risk, yep. to high volume implying lower risk. Now let's start with box number one. Box number one is characterized by high volatility, very difficult to predict customer demand. As a result, we are going to design the supply chain strategy such that we position inventory upstream in the supply chain. So this is a centralized supply chain strategy. Why upstream? Because it allows us to risk pull, to pull demand from many different locations and improve our forecast accuracy relative to what the company did before. This allows us to reduce inventory costs dramatically. This is what I call in the, book, in the book, a pool based supply chain strategy. Centralize inventory upstream and then ship to the retailer through regional distribution centers that serve as cross dock facility. Yeah. Box two is different. Box two is characterized by low uh, volatility and high volume. We can predict very well as a result we want to position inventory closer to market demand at regional distribution center. What we want to do is to ship fully loaded trucks as close as possible to market demand. This allow us to reduce transportation costs. The box at the uh, bottom left hand side is a box with conflicting indicators. On the one hand, volatility is low, that's great. On the other hand, volume is low, that's uh, risky. And so here we distinguish between high margin and low margin. High margin products are products that are more risky. 
That's why they will be managed more like a pool-based strategy. We will position inventory both upstream centralized and downstream regional distribution center. On the other hand, low margin are less risky product. We will position the product in some of the regional distribution center. Yeah. All of a sudden you realize that we replace this one size fits all strategy yeah. that the company applies by four different uh, segments. Yeah, very powerful. And one way uh, Abjad to understand what we are doing is to look at the trade-off between responsiveness and efficiency. Here on the X coordinate, I'm focusing on responsiveness from short response time to long response time. And on the Y coordinate, I'm focusing on efficiency from low cost to high cost. And the line representing the trade-off is on the screen. The intuition is very simple. If I emphasize short response time, cost is high. If I emphasize low cost, typically it takes longer to respond to uh, a retailer order. And a company strategy is a point along this trade-off curve. Yeah. What we do with unified view of demand, and with supply chain segmentation, we push the trade-off curve in a direction of improvement. This implies that I can position different segments in different location on the new trade-off curve. For example, remember box one? Box one was characterized by high volatility. This is where we position product upstream in centralized location, it allows us to cut inventory cost. You can see it here. Response yeah. time is longer, but I can cut inventory cost. On the other hand, box two, characterized by low volatility and high volume, is positioned here. Why? Because here I'm emphasizing fast response time. I'm positioning the product much closer to market demand. It requires more inventory, but I'm willing to do that to achieve the benefit of short response time. Also, this allows us to reduce transportation costs because we are shipping fully loaded trucks across the supply chain. What we found the end result of this approach is, as I mentioned, focus accuracy improvement, uh, which lead to an increase in uh, service level. Increased service level is it's all about better customer experience. It allows us to reduce uh, lost sale, which is higher revenue. And it allows us to cut inventory and, uh, and waste. Very powerful. And, and this brings us to talk about the remaining two capabilities, which are smart planning or smart SNOP and smart execution. As I mentioned, SNOP is not new. It's a process that uh, has been applied for many, many years by uh, companies focusing on continuously balancing supply and demand. The traditional approach is to apply it as an extension of the consensus forecast. And because it's an extension of the consensus forecast, it's all manual, it's all based on agreement and consensus, and it's all based on intuition and gut feeling. Therefore, uh, if you're familiar, anybody who is familiar with traditional SNOP knows that this is at least a month long uh, process, sometime five weeks or six weeks long uh, uh, process. Yeah. What we have changed as part of the unified view of demand is a smart SNOP that bring together the different functional areas, remember, to agree on the data. It is integrated as part of the circular process. It is automated. What, what, what it means automated, it's not replacing decision makers. What it means is that it allow, because we are automating the process, it allow executive to think strategically at what, about what they want. Do we want in the Midwest to focus on increasing our market share? What is the strategy that we should, once we identify that the objective is market share, we let the SNOP determine our supply plan. 
Do we want in the East Coast to focus on increasing margin? Our margin in the East Coast were eroding. We need to improve. Let focus on a strategy that allow us to achieve that type of performance. And so if you look at our circular process, this circular process enable decision makers to decide on strategy rather than to argue about which plan is better. The machine is better in generating the plan. The executive are way better than the machine in identifying what should be the focus on the plan. That's really what we are doing with smart SNOP. And, and finally, we need to recognize that as great of a plan that we have, there are deviations and disruption from the plan. And we will need to be able to respond to uh, such a disruption or deviation from the plan. To introduce, the way I am thinking uh, about smart execution, I want to start with um, what companies are doing today, which is monitor their KPI. What are KPI? These are key performance indicators. This is monitoring the current performance of the supply chain. What is our inventory level? What is our service level? Um, and so forth and, and so on. In smart execution, we not only focus on KPI. KPIs are important because it tells us where we are right now, but we also focus on what I call KPPs, key performance predictor. What we want to do is to predict what is likely to happen in the near future, say six weeks from now. And then if we see that something may go wrong, we may want to stop, to stop and make a change to correct for the problem before the problem happened. Let me illustrate this idea with two examples. Think about um, a CBG company uh, looking at uh, uh, data on shipment from one of its suppliers, say in Asia. And the data suggests that lead time is starting to increase. It used to be six weeks, now it's starting to increase to seven. Right now, service level is perfect. But because lead time is starting to increase, the analytics is saying, you know, a few weeks from now, three weeks from now, your service level will be below your target service level. The automation is saying, given that three weeks from now, service level will be below target, here is what you need to do now to address the problem that yeah. you may have three weeks from now, for example, by expediting shipment from another distribution center that we have in our supply chain. Here is another example, production a shutdown. The data suggests that um, one of our suppliers has a facility, say in uh, Thailand, and maybe there was a fire close to the facility, and as a result, the, the, the facility manufacturing activities is down for a couple of, of weeks. Right now, we have enough component and supply in front of our assembly facilities in the West Coast. But the analytic is saying six weeks from now or five weeks from now, you will not have enough supply to feed your assembly line in the West Coast. And the automation is saying, hey, the best way to respond is to switch to a backup supplier right now so that we are able to address the shutdown. Now, you may think this is uh, academic. This is exactly, Amjad, uh, what I applied at the beginning of the pandemic in uh, mid-February of last year yeah. to predict that in mid-March of last year, assembly facilities and manufacturing facilities in Europe and in North America will shut down and that's exactly what happened. That's why I know KPP works, but yeah. most companies not only have not heard about this concept, certainly have not been thinking beyond the current uh, performance of their supply chain. Yeah. So one way to summarize smart planning and smart execution is to look at this table. 
in uh, uh, smart planning, in SNOP, our primary purpose is to design a supply plan. In smart execution, it's to quickly respond to a disruption. Time horizon. For this CPG that I described, the time horizon for SNOP is 80 weeks. Smart execution is typically all the way up to six weeks, no more than that. Yeah. That's a short-term response. Process. In planning, in SNOP, it's a discrete process. Even when we automated the process, it's a weekly process. Smart execution is a continuous monitoring yeah. of our business. The primary data for planning, it's historical. For execution, it's real, real time. time. The predictive, uh, the prediction objective in planning, it's all about demand and retailer order. In execution, it's about KPPs. And so uh, this, uh, Amjad, uh, brings us to the last uh, part of the uh, discussion, which is all about requirement for, su uh, for success. And I will briefly describe um, the key requirement by highlighting the data itself. So remember the data strategy yeah. that we talked about, the technology that you need. Uh, certainly uh, the need to complement supply chain and business professional with data scientists. Uh, I'm just people like you, people like your colleagues. And the, the importance of complementing art, which is the, the business intuition, the business insight that people have with data science so that we get more than we can get from each one of them. Now, that's a very high level requirement for success. You may ask, what are the details? So let me quickly cover the detail. And there are a number of components that I emphasize in any digital transformation journey. The first is the vision. Assess the baseline where you are, identify the North, the, the North Star, and plan for how to close the gap between where you want to be and where you are. Nobody is going to wait 18 months to see results. And so you, you need very quickly, in a matter of four to six weeks, to show potential value for accuracy improvement, inventory reduction improvement, service level increase, and so forth and so on. And this we do with offline data. Um, that we analyze to show the potential benefit from such an approach. The operating model is of course critical. One example here is developing a new process like the circular process that I mentioned. Talent strategy is for a lot of companies is a big challenge because most of the companies that uh, I work with and maybe I'm just you work with, uh, with are not Facebook, are not uh, Amazon or Google, yeah. attracting data scientists, uh, mentoring data scientists, uh, promoting data scientists is not in their DNA. And that is critical if you want to complement your business professional with uh, 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 people who can use and deal with data effectively. And finally, identify the appropriate organizational structure I mentioned one example, the center of excellence. I'm sure there are other examples to talk about uh, that may help companies in their digital transformation too. Very, very powerful stuff. Uh, one thing, uh, David, that I'll ask, then I'll ask you a few questions that people have, uh, but on the data science topic, uh, one tension that I have seen people run into is, uh, different styles of uh, data science. So some data scientists, they are using uh, black box methods. Some are using transparent methods. Uh, so the ones who are using black box method, since the black box method, if it is a really big neural net and it is end-to-end -end differentiable and all that good stuff, but there is no explainability, there is no uh, way to say what it is doing. Uh, I have seen this tension uh, for data scientists to say, just trust my trust my network. But the business people are saying, 
you have to share with me, you have to explain uh, what it is doing. And I have seen that while statistical machine learning, you know, may not be as uh, sexy these days, but in the supply chain industry, since, you know, decision trees and other things have a lot of explainability and uh, they are more transparent, I have seen those methods more successful uh, because you are able to explain to an audience what your method is doing. So have you run into, David, that kind of attention? And what is your suggestion on the whole, uh, you know, good old machine learning versus the modern deep learning era in which we are these days? So uh, a few comments, but at a high level, you, you really are saying things that are very similar to my experience. But uh, details matter. So let, let me dive into each of your uh, comments. The first that I will say is I have never met a business executive who will get an advice from a black box and yeah. will follow it uh, exactly Blindly. the way the yeah. black box. Yeah. Yeah. Um, decomposing the forecast, explaining the forecast, yeah. generating an insight. Why? Let me, let me give an example. In this CBG implementation, there were multiple questions that uh, uh, executive came up with and the technology had to uh, uh, um, help address. One is, hey, you are telling me that um, um, forecast for this product family will increase by 5% in the next quarter. I don't understand where it's coming from. If you cannot explain what drives the increase in, in demand, in revenue, in sales, nobody's going to believe it. Let's yeah. give another example, another complaint. Um, you generate a forecast and uh, the finance executive is saying, hey, I don't understand. You generate a forecast for December. Today, you generate a forecast for December that is 5% below the forecast for December that you gave me last month. Why is that? If we cannot explain why the forecast generated today was different than the forecast generated a month ago, nobody is going to, to believe either of the forecast, right? Because it's for them, it's just a random number that uh, is not explainable to the audience. A third question that uh, we hey, I understand the forecast, but look, the forecast for September was different by 10% than actual sales in September. Can you explain why it is? And so the ability to answer these three levels of question. Question number one, what drives sales in December? Question number two, why is your forecast today for December is different than the forecast you gave me for December a month ago? And the third question, why your forecast for last month was 10% below or ahead um, of what actually happened? If we cannot explain that, nobody is going to go. So explainability is clearly one important part of this uh, digitization paradigm. The second element is with respect to machine learning. Machine, there are lots of buzzwords around. Yeah. Reinforcement learning, deep learning, deep reinforcement learning, deep neural, it's all over. Here is what I, I found. And in fact, I, I am giving this um, um, discussion with you right after I finished a seminar at MIT on reinforcement learning for inventory optimization. Amjad, you, 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 you will like this because you spend time at MIT. So you know the type of question people ask in a seminar, uh, in an academic seminar. What we basically showed in this discussion is that if you apply just black box reinforcement learning or machine learning, it's not necessarily going to be effective for managing inventory in your business. But if you take reinforcement learning as an example, or machine learning as another example, and you combine it, Amjad, with domain knowledge, you can do way better than either the reinforcement learning 
or the domain knowledge can do. That's why it's so important to bring together the data science and the business sector. And the domain knowledge. No, that is that is awesome. Let me just ask you a few questions, uh, uh, David. So many of the questions from the audience are along the lines of that. Hey, for COVID-like events, you know, some people call them black swan events. Uh, what do we do to? What is your just advice in general about uh, preparing? You know, how do we certainly? You have answered that question a lot in this entire conversation, but any other, on top of what you have already said, any other advice uh, regarding black swan events that people are, you know, unable uh, to, unable to predict. This other sort of, you know, uh, person asked a question or a comment, in fact, that is what you were even saying, that at the start of the pandemic, we knew that different things are going to fall apart and different processes are going to fall apart, but we didn't do anything and we waited and we thought that it would just go away, but it didn't. Uh, so any just in general advice on, uh, since everybody is in this dealing with uh, the aftermath of COVID? I have a very long answer and a relatively short. So let me give the short answer. Okay. I, I think part of the problem is that pre-pandemic, uh, most companies focused on efficiency, cutting costs, cutting costs, cutting costs in their supply chain. And they have been very, very successful in cutting costs. But these strategies that allow companies to cut costs dramatically increase exposure to risk. What companies learned over the last 18, year, 18 months is the importance of supply chain resiliency. But this is not just ignoring efficiency and just focusing on resiliency, because resiliency is going to be costly. The key is to find the right balance between efficiency, performance, and resiliency. And I will say, this is probably a topic for another discussion, and I will say, Keep in mind, resiliency is an important philosophy that executives need to embrace. This is the way they should think about decision making. Think about the risk associated when you take decision. Don't ignore the cost impact. Don't ignore the service level impact. But incorporating resiliency philosophy as part of your day-to-day decision-making is very important. Most companies have not looked at this. We are starting to see now a focus on finding the right balance between resiliency and efficiency. This one last question, David, is along the lines of somebody saying that, hey, if my organization is very resilient and robust, and we are, if we are highly responsive as well, then can I stop or reduce my investment in the planning side of the house? If I am that agile, if I'm that responsive, that resilience, can I divert my funds or my attention there and take those funds or focus away from planning activities because my execution is just so agile? Uh, any comments yeah. on on that? Yeah. So so um, without knowing detail, it's very yeah. hard to to answer. But what I found working with a very large uh, retailer, who uh, a retailer that is excellent in execution. If you look at what they are doing, everybody is praising them for their execution system. Now they are starting to realize that planning is also important. Because if planning is not done well, it's very costly. Their execution is, 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 is um, powerful, but their planning is lagging behind. And as a result, their cost is higher. In particular, if you don't plan well, your transportation costs may be very high. You may be shipping from Asia to Europe and from Europe to Asia again 
just because you're executing greatly does not mean that your transportation cost is where it should be. David, sir, thank you for being so, so generous with your time. I hope that we will chat in the future as well. I highly recommend your book to everybody who's listening. I have been using that book. It's a, it's a, it has been a desk reference for me. Uh, and then certainly uh, uh, people to reach out to you uh, for collaboration with Data Science Lab. But this just has been awesome. So thank you. Thank you for being so kind and so generous with your time, sir. Thank you.